Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters, your Magic the Gathering source that helps you command your budget. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. We also have a ton of brand new t-shirt designs in stock, so make sure you check out those as well. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. Hey everyone, Mitch coming in from the Commander's Core studio. Welcome to the show. So, things are getting pretty crazy during pre-spoiler season. And again, yes, I do say pre-spoiler season because... Spoiler season officially starts tomorrow, the 27th, and yeah, um, now apparently Jin Gataxius is going to be in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, and that fact pretty much has been confirmed, but what hasn't been confirmed is the Jin Gataxius card, though we do have an image of what appears to be one. Though it's a bit hard to read, and you'll see why here in a second. Now, like all of the other episodes where I talk about potential spoilers, a huge disclaimer that this card has most definitely not been confirmed, and myself and many others are pretty skeptical of this card and the translation for it. Let's jump into it to see why exactly. So the image that appeared on Reddit is this one, and you might notice that, well, that definitely looks like Jin Gataxius, and we'll basically, I'll show you here in a bit as to how that basically is confirmed to be an image of Jin Gataxius and the art, and um, yeah, the actual text though is in Phyrexian. Now I personally can't speak or write Phyrexian, but there are those scholars out there in Magic that work to translate Phyrexian, which is very impressive. Again, the image itself is pretty blurry, and again, the language is in Phyrexian, so how legitimate this card is, I'm really not sure. Now, I did mention that Jin Gataxius is confirmed to be on Kamigawa for Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, and I believe, and please correct me below in the comments if I'm wrong, that essentially in the one of the Kamigawa stories, it was revealed that Jin Gataxius is there, and there was even some new art to show off in that article. Now, you probably noticed that this is obviously not the art that we saw in the previous image. However, yesterday, a new piece of artwork was posted to Reddit, and as you can see, it, it, it is basically the exact same art. So that does lend some credence to the actual image being real. Though again, I am not 100% convinced. So please, with all this, take everything with a grain of salt. But with that, I'm going to cover the card in its supposed translation from Phyrexian. And again, I do not write or speak Phyrexian, and I can't read it. So I am just counting on others of the internet to uh, apparently catch. So the translation that I have seen floating around is this one. Though I actually haven't seen the apparent full name of this card, still, we're just gonna go with Jin Gataxius, a 5-5 Phyrexian Praetor for 5 blue blue. And the supposed translation is, whenever you cast your first instant or sorcery spell each turn, it costs zero. And whenever your opponent casts their first instant or sorcery spell each turn, counter that spell. Now, obviously, these might be some rough translations. Again, it's just what I found out there. But we're going to be moving forward with this, assuming that this is the correct translation. And again, this could be, well, again, this could just be a fake card, number one. Number two, the translation could be wrong. So we don't know, but we're moving forward with this for now. And if this is a real card and this is a real translation, my goodness, is this going to be an overpowered commander that is going to be absolutely brutal to play against. First off, just by having Jenga Taxis in play, the player can cast free instants and sorceries each turn. Now they can only cast one free spell each turn, but again, you can cast you know, a spell on your turn. Then if you've got instants, one on each of your opponent's turns as well. So that's four free spells every single trip around the table. 
And yeah, of course, it doesn't have any restriction on how big or small that spell has to be. So yeah, if you've got a nine mana spell, you can just cast it for free. And of course, you know, these Phyrexians have one big upside for the player and one big downside for the opponent. And uh, yeah, the downside is quite massive because each of your opponent's first instant sorcery spell they cast each turn is countered. Not just on their turn, on any turn. So if they're casting any instant sorcery, no matter when it is, the first one is countered. So to get through that, they're going to have to cast two spells. This makes Jingataxius very hard to work around and really hard to remove because you essentially, again, need at least one removal spell and then something else you can just waste and to cast both of them on the same turn. And then if the Jenga Taxius player has a way to stop you, well, you just burn two spells for one, and Jenga Taxius is still there. So yeah, if this is a legitimate card in a legitimate translation, my goodness is this thing overpowered, brutal, and well, I I'm not looking forward to ever playing against it, let's just say that. Now, I probably should have mentioned this before, but I'll cover it quickly. For those of you wondering about the Phyrexian language, we have seen it on some previous cards. Of course, the original Praetor cards, like the original Elish Norn and Jinga Taxius, and actually even a newer version of Vorinclex, which we saw, I believe, back in Kaldheim, that also came with the Phyrexian language. So, yeah, there is some precedent to seeing this on Praetors, and I definitely think that if we're going to be seeing Praetors moving forward, they're going to have the treatment, so... Yeah, again, the, the actual Phyrexian language on a Jinga Taxius isn't all that surprising since we know that Jinga Taxius is going to be in this set. That being said, if this new Jinga Taxius is real and you want to build around it, well, let's talk about what kinds of cards you might want to consider. And the first card that came to my mind, which is incredibly brutal with this commander, would be Arcane Laboratory. This is basically a rule of law, but in blue, an enchantment for two in a blue, and it says each player can't play more than one spell each turn. So good luck to your opponents trying to do, well, anything. Or at least I should say with instants and sorceries. Because again, your opponents, if they cast an instant or sorcery, it's going to be countered by your commander, and they can only cast one spell each turn. So this effectively shuts them out of casting instants and sorceries, which, you know, is the main way that people actually, you know, use to remove things, so... Good luck dealing with uh, Arcane Laboratory or your commander. Another card that came to mind was God Pharaoh's Statue and other kind of taxing cards like it. It's a legendary artifact that says spells your opponent's cast cost two more to cast. At the beginning of your end step, each opponent loses one life. Making your opponents have to pay more for all their spells is going to be even more brutal because, again, if they're going to try to, you know, cast two instant or sorceries in a turn, they're going to have to pay a lot more for that to actually get one through. And of course, having the old Jinga Taxius in this new build could be incredibly brutal as well. It's a 5 4 flash that says, beginning of your end step, draw 7 cards. Each opponent's maximum hand size is reduced by 7. Basically, you draw a lot of cards, and your opponents don't have hands. So again, like Arcane Laboratory, this can make it incredibly difficult to ever, you know, basically cast an instant or sorcery, because they're going to have to wait to draw into more cards to actually have two of them to try to get one through. Next up, some other cards that this deck might want to utilize, again, in a very controlly build, would probably be, you know, counterspells like Counterspelled, Rewind, and Sublime Epiphany. Obviously, your opponents can still cast things other than Instance of Sorceries, or they can try to cast two to actually get one through. But yeah, you can basically still have free answers to their spells with one free counterspell each turn, essentially. Obviously, Counterspell is the original. It's going to counter target spell. Rewind can be fantastic in this kind of a deck, though. Counter target spell, untap up to four lands. So, again, not only are you able to cast this for free, but you also get to untap lands to essentially net mana when casting this. And of course, there are much larger counter spells out there, like Sublime Epiphany. And again, the mana cost, again, doesn't really matter all that much if it's your first instant or sorcery cast in that turn. It says choose one or more. Counter target spell, counter target activator triggered ability, return target nominee in front to its owner's hand, create a token that's copy target creature control, target player draws a card. So a, a lot of beneficial things happening, and again, for the low, low cost of zero. I would also consider a ton of instant speed draw spells like Opportunity, Dig Through Time, and Pulse of the Grid. Again, you're going to want to take as much advantage of those free spells each turn that you can, so having instants is huge, and having ways to keep your hand full is, well, very important in this kind of attack. Opportunity is going to draw you four cards, dig through time, says look at the top seven cards of your library, put two of them in your hand, the rest of them on your library in any order, and Pulse of the Grid is actually a spell that you can cast over and over again. 
It says, draw two cards and discard a card from your hand. Then if an opponent has more cards in hand than you, return Pulse of Grid to its owner's hand. So again, if an opponent happens to have more cards than you, you can cast this at the end of one person's turn, and then again at the end of the next person's turn, etc, 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 to keep just digging deeper into your deck. And next up, again, your commander actually doesn't, you know, stop your opponents from casting things like creature spells, so control things in a different way with plenty of fantastic spells like Spectral Deluge, Consuming Tide, and Aether Gale. Spectral Deluge says return each creature your opponent's control with toughness X or less to its owner's hand or X the number of islands you control. So this in many situations can basically be a one-sided board wipe. And then Consuming Tide says each player chooses a non-land permanent they control, return all non-land permanents not chosen this way to their owner's hands, then you draw a card for each opponent who has more cards in their hand than you. So essentially, you know, keep Jin in play and bounce a ton of things back to their owner's hands. Or you can get more specific with something like Aether Gale, which says return six target non-land permanents to their owner's hands. Again, there are plenty of fantastic control spells in blue, and yeah, you're going to want to utilize them very effectively with a commander like this. But you can also utilize some massive spells, and again, having your commander let you cast these for free is absolutely absurd. Cards like Amanatu's Augury, Monomic Deluge, and Expropriate. Amanatu's Augury says... Exile the top eight cards of your library. You may put a land card from among them on the battlefield until end of turn for each nominate card type. You may cast a card of that type from among the exile cards without paying its mana cost. Basically, hey, cast this massive spell to cast more spells for free. Oh yeah, and, and also ramp too. And speaking of getting extra value out of a spell, Monomic Deluge says, Exile target, insert sorcery card from a graveyard, copy that spell three times. You may cast the copies without paying their mana cost. Exile to Monomic Deluge. This can give you a ton of value. I mean, just, just think about Aminatu's Augury in your graveyard and then Monomic Deluging it. Insane. Or, you know, you can just win with an overpowered spell like Expropriate, which says, starting with you, each player votes for time or money. For each time vote, take an extra turn after this one. For each money vote, choose a permanent owned by the voter and gain control of it. Exile Expropriate. Now, if your opponents are voting in the way that they probably should be, you're going to be getting, what, one time vote and three money votes? So, one extra turn and one thing from each of them. And yeah, that's usually enough to win. And if any of them votes for time, they're all going to be in real big trouble giving you even more extra turns. But yeah, overall, if this new card is actually real, my goodness, is it overpowered, brutal, and something I probably never want to play against. That being said again, like I've said in all these episodes, and especially with this one, please, 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 please take everything with a grain of salt. This has not been confirmed. And the translation, again, I cannot read Frexian, so I don't know how legitimate that is, so that has not been confirmed either. That being said, I am really excited for spoiler season to officially start tomorrow, so make sure you're staying tuned to this channel for more spoilers and more quick takes and whatever other exciting things are coming our way in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. And with that, the show is coming to a close, so it's my turn here from you. So in the comments below, let me know what your thoughts on this episode are, and as always, thanks again and have a good one.